WSN Podcast presents The Three Wise Men. Hello, everyone. I'm Danny Holbrook, alongside Nate Garlock and Miles Holiday, and our special guest tonight, Lima Central Catholic football players. I say that, football players like men, Matthew and Michael Quabman. Guys, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yes, sir. Yeah. Absolutely. Take it away, Miles. Oh, fellas, <laughs> um, it- you're a week away from the season ending. Unfortunately, you didn't uh, go as far as you wanted to. Uh, everybody's had a tough time against Columbus Grove. Um, have you recovered a little bit? I know as a, as a former player, that last time I stepped on a football field, it took me a while to get uh, over that. How are you guys doing with that? Uh, I think I'm getting through it better than I thought I would. But, I mean, not being able to play in the game, I don't know if that's helped or hurt it. But I haven't been able to watch it on film yet and see how that's going. So that might bring up some open wounds but I mean yeah uh after the game you know you're sore after a couple of days but I mean right back to work so I mean we'll see how that goes basketball starts in a couple of weeks yeah so. <laughs> yeah you guys being brothers I mean what, what does that mean to get to spend the whole season playing together and you know is it does it consume you do you talk about it all the time hey I saw you do this I saw you do you critique each other there's a little bit of rivalry right I mean that's yeah, just natural yeah uh, so we have some heated moments in practice for sure or <laughs> tried to stick it to them. But, I mean, when we get home, we're brothers again. But, I mean, we would always watch film together and just talk about football, like, all the time. Like, we love football, and that's kind of, like, our main thing. And uh, we, would, we would study it together sometimes. But there's always some rivalry moments where – and then you get in the game, and I, he would be the first to tell you that – I'm always telling him when he messes up and <laughs> yeah. just critiquing each other. Michael, I mean, are you ever like looking at him like, will you just shut up already? <laughs> yeah. I mean, growing up though, watching him, it was kind of cool to get to play with him. Like, cause I mean, being the underclassman, I thought I was gonna be watching him the two years, but getting a chance to play, it was really cool. And I mean, I don't know, that's a lot of instant feedback, <laughs> even in the games, you know. You know, that's what I was going to ask about, Michael, you know, because you guys have played football, you know, your whole lives. You guys have always grown up, but you never really have crossed paths in, in games, right? Because even in, down in midgets, you know, Matthew, BB Varsity, JV, and then junior high never uh, together at the same time. So these last two years, you know, obviously, Matthew, with you being a senior and going to be moving on, Michael, you still got a few years left. What has these last two years meant for you guys? Like, obviously, I think, you know, we understand when you get older and you become, you know, adults, it'll look back, reflect on a little bit more. But what's the last two years meant for you guys to be able to kind of experience this together, gone through a lot of success, highs, lows, all those things? Well, I would say it's something you don't really take in until after it's over. I'm sure looking back uh, in a few years, we'll be like, dang, yeah, I missed that. But I mean, it's been special because ha- having a teammate at home is something you're, you're just never going to get away from the game. You're like you're always talking about it. And I mean, playing with my brother, it was special. Like knowing I would always have his back. Like I always, I had a dream and stuff where if anybody would mess with him, but yeah, it's, it's just been, it's been fun. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, our senior class, when I got in as a freshman, I mean, those guys, I view them just as brothers too. I mean, Carson, Billy, Matthew, I mean, I was playing games with them my whole life. So it was kind of like a little bit like it just came up on me where I was like, dang, they're actually my teammates now. So, I mean, it was really cool to get to play with them. And You guys start out the season, you have that tough loss at Shawnee, and you guys really regrouped. And as the season went along, you guys just really, really progressed. You have that Grove game in crazy weather conditions. That, like I said, we talk about all the time, the only bad weather week we had all year. And then you get the rematch. I mean, talk about the season as a whole and, and the improvements and the things you guys saw. Uh, well, week one was definitely a tough one. The, that was – that was definitely somewhere sometime you just had to look at uh, us in the mirror as a whole and kind of regroup and like, all right, we're not as good as we thought we are. We got to get better. And I think we did a great job of bouncing back mm-hmm. and uh, getting, we strong oh, a few some too, wins. Yeah. Yep. And we also switched offensive coordinators midway through the year with Coach Palti, the head coach, coming back to call plays. And I think that kind of helped us out because we had a lot. He had been our offensive coordinator for sure. the past how many years. And, you know, you have a lot of confidence in him. But – uh, that that Shawnee loss, I mean, probably helped us more than it probably would have in the long run. Now, we, Danny and I just left Troy Parker. He was on the radio with us, and um, I see you smiling right there. <laughs> Troy, he, he, yeah. he told us uh, some great stories about uh, you for sure, Matthew. But he wanted to say, uh, make sure that we shared uh, with you guys. Uh, that he said that he loves you guys. Um, 
that tells me that there, that's something special going on in that program, right? Uh, what's it like being in a program where it's okay for guys to say the, that we love each other? Well, <laughs> my dad and Troy are probably, if you see them, they're never not together. I mean, we've always, I mean, Carson, Michael, Brady, we've played two-on-two knee football since we are in kindergarten, basketball, jumping on a trampoline, playing outside. I mean, we were never not together. Like, me and Carson, he thought, everyone thought I was his little brother mm -hmm. until I got to high school. We were just always playing games and always together competing. And, yeah. Yeah, I mean, Troy, when he got put on the staff this year, it's like I've always viewed him as, like, another father almost just because, like he said, we were always around each other growing up. And, I mean, that was really cool to get to – see his point of view and when he brought that into practice and stuff. So. What, inside the program, what, what's the culture like? It's a family. I mean, everyone can depend on each other. And it's very tight-knit. Like, you know all your coaches. They'll always be there for you. If you need anything, like, they'll be there for you no matter what. Yeah, I mean, coming into high school, it's really like a brotherhood. Like, even during the season especially, but outside the season, like, you can go to any of the coaches, any of the guys. I mean – it's a small community, so we all know each other and we all help each you other You can out. see, you look at different programs in the area and the good ones always do one thing. They always replace their really good players with really good players. Look at the last class that left last year and then you guys fill it again. Now you guys are coming up. Is that part of the culture? It's the next man up mentality? I would definitely say that. Uh, like when I was when I was a ball boy, just like getting to watch Sean Thomas and Rossi Moore, you're like, oh, those are good players. Oh, man. Those are really yeah. good players. Man, I want to be them. And then <laughs> you got, I'm sure he watched Carson. And, and then you go to my class, and I'm just – like I said, I really hope the program just keeps building. And that coaching really does help that. We have a great coaching staff. Is it tough to play – you know, you don't play at the school. Is it tough to play at Lima Senior High School? Do you wish you guys had your own field? <laughs> it depends how that field looks because Lima Stadium is pretty nice. Yeah. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it's tough because, like, I, we kind of view that as our home field. Sure. It's not really – but it would be nice. We've talked about it for a really long time. But, yeah, Lima Stadium is a nice – it's a nice field. Well, I love Nate, it. you're an alum. Can't you donate? Yeah, you know, I, you know I, we priced it a couple of times. And, I, you know, I had to backdate a check. I, some of the, cher up, some of the cherries I work with were going to have to take a hit, and I just didn't think that that was going to be fair. So, yeah. um, you know, you know, Matthew, they talked about the, the class that left last year, the success that you guys had, obviously playing with Carson and all those guys and Billy and all them. You know, coming in this year, then obviously as the senior, having to take over, kind of step into that leadership role. What's that been like for you this season? How much of that did you take onto your shoulders, especially when, you know, you didn't have the, the type of season that I'm sure that you envisioned as you had to battle some injuries and, and go through some adversity? Yeah, uh, I think me and Gianni McKee, we did, we always talked about how we needed to be great leaders. And uh, seeing Carson and Jacob Locke, you can just see those are standout guys that like always are doing the right thing and it, they lead the young guys in the right path you want it to be. And our coaches, uh, they were really honest this year about how we need to have leadership and I think we did a great job of that. But like you said, like I probably wasn't practicing three or four d days a week because of my ankle right. and it's just hard, harder to be like you're not in the huddle, you're not at, at practice being able to let people know when they're screwing up. So that was definitely a challenge. You know, and then, Michael, for you, obviously now with the senior class moving on, you know, you and Brady moving into juniors, but kind of being more of a focal point of that offense, having to now fill in leadership roles, even maybe as a junior, and then definitely as you move into your senior year. What's that – have you thought about that and what kind of leader you want to be as you progress? I mean, you can never really see it till it happens. But, I mean, yeah, losing Matthew, that's a big part of our running game. But we got two for underclassmen oh, like yeah. Carter Lester and Eddie. Yeah. They're going to come in. I mean, you never – I mean, you can never really fit – like, fill the shoes, but you just try and, like – I mean, they're going to help us out. And then Gianni, Chris, I mean, we're losing two big linemen up front. So, I mean, but – you brought up Lester and White, great futures for those guys. But who are some names other than those two guys that we really need to keep an eye on for next year? I mean, there's a lot of linemen in the picture. I mean, Katie Wireman, Brady Garlock, you might see them show up. I mean, but it all comes down to the offseason, who's going to get better. So I would definitely say Caden Falky too. Yeah, yeah. That kid work. Out. He works really hard and loves the game. A Any other names you want to add to it? Because they're going to listen to it and it's going to put them on blast, <laughs> right? Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I would say Eddie White. I mean, if you if you look at him, like he fits the mold as a freshman. He's 
probably six foot, 200 pounds, you're like, geez. So if he just keeps growing and working, he's going to be a good player. Matthew, we, we talk a lot about individual performances throughout the year. The game you had against Kerry, and I've said it on this show before, I, I thought it was the performance of the year, both sides of the ball, offense and defense. That night, did you feel like you were in the zone, like you could do no wrong? I mean, every time you touched the ball, something magical was happening. Uh, it, it felt good. I mean, <laughs> especially those first two weeks, we just had shaky starts, and it was like, all right, we got to turn it on. And I remember the – probably one of the first few plays of the game, they ran that screen that I picked yeah. off and a uh, coach got on me and I was like, I'm going to pick that one off. And then I picked it off. And every time I got the ball, I saw a hole and it just felt like nobody could really tackle me. Honestly. Yeah. Now tell us about that because I heard rumors that you really got in trouble when you tried to go the first yeah, time, right? Definitely. <laughs> he, uh, but you had the last laugh. Yeah. <laughs> That's me one-on-one. -on -one. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, Coach Palti always harps on because we were playing cover two. Like, with those screens, you cannot really miss on that because then it's one-on-one, -on -one, like he said. And I went I went outside to pick it off, and the guy got, like, five yards. He was like, that's not going to happen again. I was like, I'm going to pick it off. <laughs> I, told him, I think it said it in the newspaper. I was like, I'm going to pick it off. And then I, the quarterback comes to the line, and he's like – peeking over at the receiver, and then he peeks over again. I'm like, all right, here it comes. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, all right, let's go. Is that your favorite game ever? That, uh, my sophomore year against St. John's, that was a lot of fun. I had a pick six and then a rushing and a receiving. And it was like Carson just was not throwing a bad ball. It yeah, was, right. yeah. Yeah, Bo was, both of you guys seem like you, you really love the game of football. Now, Matthew, you, you, you strike me as that guy because I was a talker when I played. You would talk back to guys, wouldn't you? Michael, do you, do you, do you get the little uh, dog talking to guys on the field at all? I mean, yeah, I'm kind of like, you know, he's very impressionable. So, like, I was never the guy to do it when I was younger. But yeah. then, you know, growing up with him is kind of. <laughs> See what you taught him? <laughs> See what you taught him. Football is not a nice game. It's not. <laughs> no. Yeah. yeah. You know, Michael, had a great year defensively. You finished at the top of the league in, in interceptions. But really started to take on a bigger role on the in the offense as the season went on. What What – has being able to, I mean, you've always played both sides of the ball, but obviously playing varsity is, is, is different. You know, there's a lot more involved in that. But being at a school like LCC, a lot of kids are playing both ways. What's it like playing at a high level on both sides of the ball? And what's your favorite side to, to play? I mean, I really enjoy offense, but I mean, my freshman year, because that's all I had to do. And then your sophomore year, you're like, dang, it's just like, <laughs> you always feel tired. You're always it's always battling adversity on both sides of the ball because I have a turnover, you're right back to it. So, I mean, I don't know. I would say uh, when playing, like, offense, that's definitely better for me just because I enjoy that more. But defense, you know, I had to step up this year and play it a little more because, I mean, it was a little different because last year, you know, playing JV defense and then <laughs> coming to varsity, you know, they're a lot bigger and – well, it seemed yeah. to work out just yeah. fine, fine yeah. this I'm sure Coach Palti was happy to have you on that defensive side of things. All right, fellas, it's time for me to ask you. Oh, I'll ask everybody. Is. Here it is. They make fun of me. I'm going to tell you right now. We've had a lot of players on here, and some of them had said their answer is LCC. So don't feel bad about what you're about to say. Everybody's listening. The one team you really enjoy beating the most. You see that grin? I did. <laughs> I did. He's like, just one? He's thinking. He's a deep thinker. There's yeah. a couple of them. No, I, I, need, I need that one that stands up like, we're going to smack these guys, and I'm really going to enjoy this. I wish we had been in the NWC my whole four years, but – Without, I would say St. John's. I got a lot of St. buddies over Holy there. War. That's what I was yeah. going to say. It's probably hard for you guys because, you know, you know, Matthew, you spent three years playing an independent schedule, yeah. a lot of revolving teams. It hasn't been that consistency yeah. of every year we've been able to build these rivalries. Yeah. How about you, Michael? I mean, I know I got one in mind. When we were younger, I mean, us and Bluffton, we just went at it. So yeah. I'm really yeah. looking forward to that game next yeah. year. They had our number this year, but, I mean – We'll be right back to it next year. So hopefully I'm it's a dry field one. next year. <laughs> and, and the lights work, <laughs> yeah. you know, all, all, all this stuff. So, you know, so Matthew, obviously your senior football, high school football has come to a close for you. What's that next step look like for you? Is, are you in the middle of recruitment? You got schools looking at you. How's that looking? Yeah, well, I'd kind of like just basically said to myself, like football, I love football. Like I just, I want to play football and I've been talking to schools. I've, I've been in touch with a lot of D3s and then some D2s. Uh, I went on a visit to Ashland, and I really liked it there. Good and, program. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, it was nice up there. And then, obviously, I got some buddies up at ODU, and I've been talking to them. Like, 
reuniting with Carson would be fun. <laughs> yeah, but absolutely. We'll see how this next couple of months. What type go. of field to study? Hmm? What, what do you want to study? With uh, I want to be a salesman. Class, Matthew. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I didn't hear you. He's, yeah, he's like, well, we don't play. We, we, we don't study football. Like, that's not what I can do. <laughs> it's not the Cardell Jones program. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't hear you. I apologize. <laughs> no, what is the field of study you want to go Business. into? Business. Okay, yeah, cool, yeah. cool. And Michael, do you want to go playing uh, college football someday? I mean, yeah. I mean, going into high school, it was never in the. It was like never in the picture football. But I mean, now, I mean, it's. I don't know. Like he said, I mean, football, that's all we do, all we know. So, I mean, but baseball would probably be the more nice. looking into that. But, I mean, we'll okay, see. Okay, Michael, now, that, uh, now the season's over, what's what's the workouts look like? How, how many, you know, what are you doing? Give us a typical I mean, week at LCC. Because I play basketball. Okay, we got to okay. practice. I mean, they talked about lifting before school, so it's either lift before school or after. Like and yeah. then get together on the weekends whenever you can and throw. But, I mean. Absolutely no rest for you guys over there, is it? You get done with football, get about a day break, and then it's right on to the next sport. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Mm. All right. You guys got anything else for them? No, yeah, I got one last question. Okay. A lot of speed at the skill positions for you guys. Everybody's going to race over there at LCC. Who's the fastest guy on that team? Uh, this well, year? Yeah, this, this year. year. This, this year, year yeah. is definitely between, I would say, Milan and Lawson. Yeah, Lawson would be pretty angry if yeah. we didn't say him. Yeah, Lawson, exactly. it, there's, a, there's a lot of speed on that outside for yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. My lawn's my lawn, I would say my lawn. Yeah, he, could, he could scoot, man. Yeah, yeah. 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 Well, thanks so much for coming in, guys. Yeah, best of, of luck with you and, and graduating this year. And best of luck. We'll get you again because you're going to be here yeah. in the next couple of years. <laughs> we'll call your name a lot on WSN. So yeah. congratulations on everything you guys have done. You, you've, you've held the shield up for Lima Central Catholic. And uh, best of luck to both of you guys. Appreciate it. Thanks, yeah. fellas. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thank you. It's the Diamond Dave Bowen best thing we saw all week. Miles, we see a lot of things, and uh, now that we're in postseason, this is the third week of high school football, we're seeing some really, really good programs, some outstanding players. So, you know, Randy Roberts and I, we had that uh, LCC uh, rematch against Columbus Grove last week, and um, Carson... Um, I did it again. It's not Carson. It's, it's Brady. Brady. It's Parker. Brady. That's okay. Brady That's the brother. We, we all do it, yeah. So Brady uh, against uh, Pandora Gilboa. Um, ran quarterback lead and just beat up Pandora Gilboa all night long, right? Ran for 135 yards, right? And so you knew Columbus Grove was going to be worried about that. Well, they didn't need to be worried about it because they had two guys that were fantastic, Austin Gander and Kylan Mays, the inside defensive tackles for Columbus Grove. Uh, gentlemen, those two were just absolute monsters. I could not believe how good Austin Gander was. At one point in time, he was so strong, he got rid of his offensive lineman and grabbed Brady Parker by one one arm and just pulled him down to the ground. And as we know, Brady is a big physical a dude, strong, right? Kid, yeah. yeah. So those two guys uh, did a, a great job of taking away the inside run for Columbus Grove. Those guys are a big reason why Columbus Grove won that uh, football game. And then we watch high school football all the time, especially early in the year. We see a defensive lineman jump off sides, right? Nope. Quarterback cheats, goes up there and says, hut all night long. And all of a sudden he goes, hut, hut. And the guy jumps on the first one, right? And we just say, oh, that's high school football. That's high school football. Well, I'm here to tell you, it's not just high school football. It's in the NFL as well. If you saw the Steelers. Jeez, what game could this possibly have happened in, Danny? Wow. <laughs> could you? That's could you? That was amazing, wasn't it? Because everybody in America knew what the Steelers were going to do. They were going to go up and try to get the, the commanders to jump offside, and it still happened. A defensive lineman in the NFL jumped offside. The Steelers were able to seal that victory with an offside call. It was, it was one of those things that said, hey, high school kids, you can laugh at the NFL now. Yeah, congratulations. You got the Steelers in there. <laughs> all right. Yeah, all right. What about you, Nate? What's the uh, best yeah, so, so for me, I had, I had two as well. Um, the first one is – you know, I, so I had the Ottawa Glendorf Shelby game o over the la this last weekend, yeah. and Shelby, the Shelby community was really going through a tough time. They unfortunately <laughs> lost a young man in that community during the during the week uh, to an unfortunate accident, and that's a small community. And we know things in small communities tend to hit a little differently and hit a little harder just because of the makeups of those communities. Tight knit. Yes. And so they had a lot of things going on leading into also, Hey, we're a bunch of high school kids. We've lost our friend. We lost our teammate. We lost our brother. And now we also have to play this football game. The way that that community came together, the, the things that they did pregame, um, the game that they played and they, where they beat Ottawa and they moved on and then as 
I'm leaving that game, seeing the emotion coming out of these kids because of the heavy week that they had. And it was just a a really big reminder of, you know, all the stuff that these kids went through. And like you just said, right, they're high school kids. Yeah. And they were carrying a lot of things on their shoulder into that game, but they still came out. They still performed. That community rallied around them and and they came away with a big victory. That was really that was really great to see um, everything that they had surrounding those and how those kids performed in in the wake of of a tragedy over there. Um, And then the other one was I wanted to it's, (laughs) you know, the uh, senior class over at Shawnee for the boys soccer. Yeah. They didn't win, and so normally, you know, a team losing doesn't isn't your best thing of the week. Best things I saw. It's not necessarily the loss in the state semifinals for me. It was. Uh, I was talking with a friend of mine, and they were going over the stats of this senior class. This senior class for the Shawnee boys soccer had to have completed probably one of the greatest four year runs that we have ever seen in this really? area. Only comparable to probably the. OG girls soccer team okay. in, in soccer. Listen to some of these stats. These are for the senior class. Okay, they went seventy-one six and five Jeez. in four years. Seventy-one six, six and five. five. They had an eighty-six percent winning percentage. They were thirty-four and one in the WBL. Oh, they they scored three hundred and fifty-eight goals, which is over four goals a game. They only gave up fifty-one goals in four in years. Four years. They that's an average of 0.6 goals per game. Build that wall, man. You talk about goalies. My goodness. They, they, they gave up – in four years, they gave up four goals in a game one time, three goals in a game one time, and two goals four times. Other than that, it was shutouts or one goal. Wow. They had four Western Buckeye League championships, four sectional championships, three district championships, two regional state championships, and a state championship. They, they they had four first team Western Buckeye players, five second team Western Buckeye players, three third or two third team Western Buckeye players, a two honorable mentions, a Western Buckeye player of the year, two first team all district players, and two second team all district players, and also an all Ohio player this year. The Sounds the like run the soccer coach needs to come on this show. <laughs> the the run that they went on is absolutely phenomenal. So I just wanted to shout out these guys real quick. It was Luca Luca Facillo, Noah Scheid, Drew Niedemeyer, Caleb Miller, Rhett Frazier, Tate Bender, Jaden Harrison, Adam Jamai, Coda Miller, and Thomas Coe. Those all those guys That's accomplished amazing. all of those things in the last four years. It it has to be one of the greatest yeah. four years amazing. of any class ever. Nate, those are program numbers. That's not a team. That's program. That's culture. That that's something special, right? There. Absolutely. We talk about Marion Local with their numbers, and I, and I was prepping for my game this week, and their numbers are staggering. That that's comparable. Yeah, it really that, that is. senior class, what they were able to accomplish over their four years and be a part of, and a lot of those guys, it wasn't like their freshman year they watched. There were there were four starters yeah, all, out of that wow. group that played and or played significant and minutes they were successful. And, and they and they continued <laughs> to help win and, and built almost, something real special there. Almost as impressive as watching Nate eat pancakes. That's that's, that's almost. almost now listen yeah. I, I, listen I'm super impressed with what Shawnee's done over there. Yeah. But let's we get let's the not, bar's pretty yeah, high with the pancake let's, eating. Let's, okay. Well, this, yeah. Let's so yeah, no the, the the kids did a great job. Um, it was great to be able to watch them over the last four years, see all that they have accomplished. That you know it was like. Like I've mentioned, probably the greatest four-year run outside Absolutely. of what the OG girls soccer team has been able to do. So congratulations to those guys on, on a very successful high school career. Yeah, guys, I had the Wapakoneta wilmington game last Friday night. Uh, Darren Gilbert and I did. Uh, wilmington came out, and their quarterback, really nice kid, uh, throws a really good ball. They marched down the field, took an early 6-0 lead on Wapak. Gilly and I were stunned. Everybody in the stadium was stunned. And then Wapak reeled off 48 in a row, I believe it was, and just destroyed them. Uh, that program, the, the most impressive thing I saw last weekend. And Caden Page had the catch of the year for me in the corner of the end zone. Uh, Caleb Moyer, outstanding job. They are physical. They do it in the trenches on both sides of the ball. They are so well coached. The entire I'm talking about the entire game night at Wapakoneta from the introduction from the board that they have this huge thing. It, it just puts goosebumps on you. The crowd is unbelievable. The concessions. I mean, it, everything is the way it is to be successful. And it's mind blowing when you go over there, how they even treat us at WSN, how the press box is pristine. Guys, it is an impressive program. Yeah, it, it still baffles me when people are like, I, we just don't understand how they can be good all the time. 
Well, what do you mean? Because that's the standard. Well, you, yeah. you, it's it's it's, it, it's very easy to understand why they are good all the time. They have implemented yeah. this. It is entrenched in everything that they do, and there's everybody understands that standard. And you either rise to the standard or you're going to get left behind. There is no moving the bar around over there. Yeah, yeah I, I think the only thing that maybe stops them on their march to uh, Canton is injuries. If they stay healthy, I think they're going to be okay. All right, guys, let's do it. Let's look at this week's matchup. It's week three of the Ohio High School football playoffs, and we have got some dandies. Game one, fellas, Delphi St. John's versus Lipsick. Randy Roberts, Miles Holiday on the call. Delphi St. John's is the darling right now of the area. A I'm just going to say it, a really bad regular season. And these guys, these Jays, are in the third round. And then you look at Lipsick, a 500 season, and they're in the third round. Something's got to give. Uh, Danny, this might be the best 11 versus 15 matchup of the know, weekend. Right? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I went back and I watched that Lipsick versus uh, um, uh, Ada matchup that you yeah, and Gilly yeah. did, and I, I really thought Gilly did a really good job. Yeah, yeah, I watch your stuff too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I went and watched it, and I came away impressed because because uh, Mark Kirkendall, the, the quarterback, is fantastic, right? Just a freshman. He, uh, he, he is uh, on Danny's man crush list. <laughs> 2,400 yards, 20 TDs, 63% completion. But it's not just him, right? You, you had that, ta- that team. Lammers is fantastic. Breck is really good. He gets a lot of yardage from catch after the ball. His outside receiver is really good. And the run game, Danny, as you, you saw firsthand, is really improved, hasn't it? Oh, it's it's fantastic. Yeah, I, I just I love everything about this matchup because, guys, they have the chance to ro- right so many wrongs this year. You know, they Devil St. John's had major injuries. They're getting guys back or getting key players back. Not everybody. And then you look at Lipsick. They weren't even supposed to be at this point. They're so young with a freshman quarterback. He's such a gunslinger. I love everything about this matchup. Yeah, I mean, this is just like everybody predicted it for a regional semifinal, right? right? It was Delphi St. Yeah, John's sure. versus Lipsick. Absolutely. It was everybody's bracket. Yeah. Yeah. It fell just like this. The winner might get Grove. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, Delphi St. John's, it's Delphi, this matchup goes against absolutely everything that Miles stands for, and that is an expanded playoff, Truth right? <laughs> <laughs> because without an expanded playoff, we're not talking about two teams that obviously have gotten hot at the right time. Right, right. Um, Delphi St. John's has been a favorite in every one of their games. They are a favorite in this one as well. They are a five-point favorite over Lipsick. And I like St. John's in this game for one simple fact is – even though Lipsick has a phenomenal freshman quarterback, he's a freshman. He is. And, you know, one of the things that is truer or as true with dex, death and taxes is freshmen are going to make freshman mistakes. It, it's just – it's a part of growing. 13 interceptions. And it's, yep, it's, yep, it's maturity and it's growing and it's experience. It just it, – it takes nothing away from, from him as a player. It's just a part of the game. And as the lights get brighter and the games get bigger and the pressure gets more intense, you know, you're going to see what kind of player these guys are made out of. And I don't know that – as. Uh, I would put my faith in a freshman quarterback when you have experience sure. on the other side like Delphi St. John's has. They are they are getting healthy. This is the healthiest that they have been all season long. They are playing really good football. And I expect, uh, unbelievably enough, f- that we will have a regional final matchup yeah. with a 15 seed in it, it next week. Isn't that something? Yeah. yeah. Something. So this DSJ team, you said it right, getting healthy. Uh, TJ Wirtz played quite a bit last week. If he carries the football, it's going to be bad news for Lipsick. 7.2 yards carry. 6'2", 240. That's that's a big dude to tackle. Mueller's done a really good job carrying the football for DSJ. So when you're playing a freshman quarterback and you're a defensive coordinator over at DSJ, do you blitz them? Do you try to confuse them? What do you do? You want to make it difficult for them, right? Well, Alex Heron over there at linebacker for DSJ, he's got nine sacks. So I think there's your answer, right? I think DSJ sends a pressure at Mark Kirkendall, makes his life very difficult. I, I, I like the fact that DSJ is getting healthy and they have experience. Lipsick next year, watch out. The year after that, really watch out. I think DSJ, as you said, I think they move on. Yeah. Game two, guys, Marion Local and Sonia at Lima Senior. Myself and Darren Gilbert will be on the call for this one. Gentlemen, I'm going to throw some stats at you that will blow your mind in prepping for this game. Marion Local has eight shutouts on the season. They have not allowed a first-quarter point. 
They've only allowed 36 points on the season. They average three points a game defensively, or giving up three points a game. That's, that's gone up. Yeah. They, <laughs> yeah. yeah they, oh, average, they had a bad week. <laughs> they, they average 49 points a game. Now, here's the thing. I'm doing this prep work, and I'm like, passing yards, they only go for 165, and rushing yards, 219. And you're thinking, what's the, I thought those numbers would be bigger. And, and the overall total was 384 a game. But these starters are only playing up into the middle of the third quarter, and their their backups are so good. This is, I'm going to say it, and I said it again, this is the best high school football team at this level that I've ever seen, bar none. I don't think this game's going to be close, and Sonia has a nice squad. They are 11-1. and one. They run the ball. That's what they did last year. This is going to be a four-touchdown win for Marion Local, and if I'm wrong, then I'll be so stunned. So, so you said eight shutouts? Eight. Eight shutouts. You want to know why they get eight shutouts? Because they're really good. 80%, Cause, 80%, cause they, because they didn't let the other team score? 80, That's a good one. <laughs> yeah. 80, 80% yeah. of their opponent's drives begin inside the 30-yard line. So that means everybody's got to go 70-plus yards to score against a really tough Marion local football well, team. And that's what I was going to say with, with – um, you know, you talked about the rushing and the, the passing stats. Well, the reason that they're so low is because they're not having to make long drives. They have a short field yeah. consistently – and because they've punted maybe three times all season, you know, field position for their team is they're always pinned after kickoff. Then you're punting because you can't gain any yards. They're getting balls around midfield. So they're only going having to go half the field, and they're only playing two or three quarters a, a, a night. So, yeah, the, the overall numbers may not look crazy impressive, but it's because of how impressive they are as a team that actually drives down some of those stats. Yeah, and you look at the numbers individually. Drew Laos uh, – Six foot, two hundred and five pound senior. He's got thirteen touchdowns on the year, guys. He was the defensive player of the year in the back. <laughs> <laughs> How good of an athlete is him? Yeah. And you look at Justin Knopf, outstanding quarterback. We talk about good quarterbacks. Good decision This maker. kid's numbers, 106 of 148, 1,900 yards, 25 touchdowns, and only four interceptions. Yeah. And when you're up 52 to nothing, what's an interception? Well, a lot of those uh, big throws come off of play action, right? They yeah. run the ball oh. so well, and then you're throwing the guys that are wide open because everybody has to respect that run. Now, Ansonia, though, just to give you a little bit glimmer for Ansonia, okay? 11 in a row, lost week one to mm-hmm. Riverside, okay? They have scored 60, 52, 70, and 60 at different times mm-hmm. this year. But here's the drawback. Mm-hmm. 28 youngsters that play big minutes for them. Yeah. I don't think it's going to happen. Well, you know, you said when you started off, Danny, you're like, I, I'm going to give you guys some stats that blow yeah. your mind. And then you ran through some of the most incredible stats that you're going to hear when it's tied to a high yeah. school football team. It didn't blow my mind. Did it blow? <laughs> did it? Did it blow your mind? Yeah. There wasn't anything you said that I was like, "Oh my god, I can't believe that!" Because they have set the standard they have. where it honestly probably blows my mind more that I wasn't surprised by any of but, those. Ima- I mean, and we're not talking two, three no. weeks. This we're talking. We're in week twelve. But listen to this, Nate. Zane Henderson, the, the senior running back for Ansonia, is coming into this game, two hundred and eighty-two attempts. This kid's got 1,900 rushing yards. He averages 6.8 a carry, 31 touchdowns, and I'm telling you, Marion Local will hold him to 50 or less. Oh, oh, what do you want to? And that is maybe yeah. one of the best running backs in the state. And they will, and I, look, I know people get Mac fatigue; they tired of it. This is unbelievable. Well, you only get fatigue when you have to hear about somebody. <laughs> you only hear about somebody because they're really good. Yeah, you know, yeah. you know, to like you said, to give Ansoni a little bit of flowers, right? This is the toughest task that Marion Local will face up to this point in the tournament so far. Mm-hmm. And they are, this is going to be their biggest challenge so right. far. Their first two weeks, they were 49 point favorites in both of those games. In this one, they're only a 44 point favorite. So, in Sonia, it yeah. is, I mean, yeah. it, 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 it's <laughs> incredible that we are, we're talking about a regional <laughs> semi and the toughest team that, yeah. I mean, as, as, you know, theoretically, right, every week gets tougher and tougher and tougher. It's only it's a forty four point you know uh, yeah. s- uh, spread right now, right? Let, yeah. let me ask you this: If Ansonia was in the MAC, where do they finish? Fifth, fifth in the MAC. Yeah. Nate, what do you think? Well, I I would pick them behind Marion right. Local, behind Minster, behind Coldwater, behind Anna. Maybe for sales. Yeah, it's so hard to know about Versailles right know, now, right. though, too. But, yeah, I mean, I think at, at best they're a mid-pack Mac team, yep, right? I right, mean, I, just right. based off of what we've seen. Yeah, yeah. Well, what a great lead to get you ready for the run. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Guys, game three, Columbus Grove takes on Mohawk at Faustoria. Our own Mark Shine and Dar Nevergall on the call. 
It's a big test for Columbus Grove, guys. Mohawk comes in, traditional power. I like the matchup. Yeah, I'm not sure this is going to be a problem for Columbus Grove, to be quite honest with you, because uh, when you look at Mohawk, it, to me, they're more of a finesse football team. Sure. And if you're going to uh, beat Columbus Grove, I think you have to have physicality. I think you have to match that physicality. I don't know if that happens. Um, this Columbus Grove team is as about laser focused as I can remember of a team this deep into the playoffs. I interviewed Kyle Hopkins after the matchup last week when they beat LCC. And honestly, guys, there wasn't a huge celebration after that win. Guys were like, okay, what's the next step? Even Kyle Hopkins, I said uh, after the game, I said, looks like you guys still have a little more meat on the bone here. And he's like, absolutely. We, we have a goal. Uh, this is just another step into that goal. This is a defense, too. The first team defense, we, we, we gave a lot of flowers, as Nate likes to say, to Marion Local. you got to give some to Columbus Grove. Their first mm -hmm. team defense has only given up 40 points all year long. Yeah. Only 40 points. I don't know if this Mohawk team, who is a little bit physical or lacking physicality, with Ben Bogner at quarterback, I mean, he is a great player, but so He's much really of what they player. do yeah. – is around him, right? 1,951 yards passing, 1,118 yards rushing. To me, you got to have a bunch of threats and some physicality to beat Columbus Grove. Well, I don't know a one-man band gets it done. Yeah, but but I like the fact that he's a dual-threat quarterback. He you, Look, he gives you options. Anybody knows that if you are one-dimensional, you are in trouble against Columbus Grove. This kid gives you options. Yeah, I mean, I, I think – the biggest concern that I have as Columbus Grove moves through this is I, I agree with you. I don't think that they're going to have much problem this no. week. I think that this one should be, should be a win, and they should win going away. My concern is in the future. You know, we all know what's looming. It, oh, sure. It, we with, all want it. Like, yeah. It, yeah. you know, yeah. it, with that potential showdown with Marion DSJ. Local. Oh, right. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good day, right? <laughs> Give um, props. But, um, you know, but – you're talking about a potential matchup with uh, with Mary Local coming up down. Columbus Grove hasn't really been challenged yet. Nope. They, they had a one sixteen matchup to begin the, this playoff run. They just played a LCC team that was very shorthanded, and it was re very reminiscent of the LCC Bluffton game where they came in a lot of injuries. You know, as we, we talked with Matthew Michael Quatman earlier, Matthew wasn't able to play the vast majority of that game. Uh, you know, Michael got banged up as well. They had injuries on other positions, so they didn't play the same LCC team that they played a few weeks ago in, in a close matchup. Now they're going to play a Mohawk team that. I don't really think matches up well with them. I no. don't think they're going to give them much of a challenge. I, I get worried about teams as they go through a playoff run and it's easy and they don't feel some resistance because what happens, like we talked about earlier, right? That pressure ramps up, right? When we're talking about Lipsick and the lights get a little bit brighter and the expectations get to be more, but you haven't had to feel any sort of adversity yet. What's going to happen when Columbus Grove feels that first bit of adversity in the playoff How they run? Respond. How yeah. are they going to bounce back from that? That, to me, is actually the bigger question that I have for this Bulldog team moving forward. It's not oh, We know how good they are. We know what they're capable of doing. We've talked about it all season long. They're, they're a fantastic football team. They're well coached. they got dudes everywhere. But this playoff run has been easy, and I don't think that's going to change this week. I don't know that it changes next week. Right. And then now, uh, yeah. and now all maybe, and now all of a sudden you're in a state semi yeah. where I believe that's where the matchup would happen. It would. Are, are you, is this run preparing you for you know what game you need to be prepared for? Yeah. I, I honestly believe that, and I 100% I agree with you, it, it, not much of a challenge. But I agree with Miles. This team is focused. Like, they are focused. Like they, their off season workouts, we talked with Coach Schaefer a couple of weeks ago. The things they were doing and what they were preparing for, I think it's all culminating in this matchup. I don't know what's going to happen, guys, but I, they got a real shot to be special here, and it's just another hurdle Friday night, and I, I agree with you guys. I so think they're it, if you're a Mohawk fan and you're listening and you say, hey, we got no chance, well, you, you, you do. do. You, you do. do. Oh, you do. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, if Columbus Grove says, well, let's, let's roll the dice and let's kick it to Caleb Bish. Now, we talked about Amari Wash earlier in the year, right? Mm -hmm. Don't kick it to him. Do not kick it to Bish. 51 yards per average on a punt return. 42 on a kickoff return. 
So if they kick to him, he makes a big play that can spark you. We also know that Columbus Grove, very good defensively, but what do they like to run with their coverage? Cover two, right? And they're pronounced cover two, where their corners are always looking inside. Sometimes they'll even roll on inside Don't shoulder. Get caught looking inside. Yeah, so play action, right? You keep the corners still. The middle of the field against the two high safety is there. Attack the middle of the field with play action. Hit your big-time receivers in the middle of the field. And Bish and Heyman both average 18 yards a catch. Maybe that's how Mohawk wins. Love it. Game four, guys. Bluffton versus Ottawa Hills at Defiance. Garrett Mansfield and our own Evan, the Pirate Skilleter. I love that. <laughs> Evan Skilleter, our good buddy. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Is This is a rematch, correct? Right From, from last, last year. year. Yeah, yeah. Bluffton, Ottawa Hills. Um, I like this Bluffton team. I think the the beat down, as we'll call it, at Columbus Grove, I think it may be refocused these guys. They're on a nice run. We're three weeks into it. I like Bluffton. Yeah, I mean, I think I – think you saw a bit of a hangover yeah, in, in we week did. one of the playoffs against a, a Paulding team in that 116 matchup where it was only a 21 3 game. Paulding was, was in that, was really holding them. They did seem to get back to playing better football last week with that 35 0 win. They, they play an Ottawa Hills team, though, that knows how to score. Ooh, they, boy, they, they score a lot of points. Yeah. They have a 70 point a game, game. Yeah. Um, a lot of 50 point games. I mean, they, their two play games so far here in the playoffs has been 49 and 45. This is an offense that knows how to get going. They put it in the end zone. And the last time that Bluffton played an offense that knew what they were doing, it didn't work out real well for them in Week 10. Great point. This defense is going to be challenged, and they are going to have to show that they learned from that matchup against Columbus Grove and that they can get back to the defense that just shut everybody down for the first nine weeks. The defense has played well in the playoffs. They're going to need another big game this week, I mean, for sure. Well, I think Coach Richards um, said when we got to the playoffs, uh, hey, fellas, let's run the football again. You remember, they were throwing the ball all around the field, especially against Columbus Grove. Uh, Tate Gieske, who we, we love, only had one interception going into that game, had three that night. Since that time, he has taken care of the football. They got back to running the football. Gieske had 140 last week. Parker Lovell had 140. Hey, if you run for over 200 yards, you definitely like your odds, right? For sure. And that, uh, I think a lot of people said, you know, like Nate correctly said, struggled in week one against Paulding, but last week, 35 nothing over here on you're like, oh, well, this is a little bit different. This is what we expected out of Bluffton. If they take care of the football, they've got to run the football and take care of the ball. If they turn it over, don't run the ball. Ottawa Hills, I think, rolls easy. Yeah, I love the fact when coaches, you know, they, they go away from what they're good at and then they come back to it knowing that that's what they're good at. Yeah. And a sign of a good team is a team that you know what they're going to do and you still can't stop them. And well, we see that in Bluffton. Yeah, and, you know, we talked about the struggle for week one in the playoffs, but it wasn't the defense. No, right? no, The no, defense no, only right. gave up three points. Yeah. They you know, they shut out here on last week. It was the offense. And so if the defense it got themselves back into form and they learned those lessons from Week 10 where that, that game got away from them very quickly, then if they can do those same types of things against Ottawa Hills, great. But I don't think that this Bluffton team is built for shootouts. And so I don't think that you want to get into a score-versus-score score game with Ottawa Hills. The mm. defense is going to have to get, right. get the stops, and then the Bluffton offense is going to have to dictate the pace of this one. It, real concerning, too, Ottawa Hills, um, since that week one loss to Gibsonburg, 502 to 107. So they've been rolling, Ooh. right? Um, but last week they beat Fairview 45 to 20. This is a Fairview team that scores a lot of points. Doug Rakes, their head coach, you know, air raid offense, they can throw it. Real concerning for Bluffton because he held a high powered Fairview team to only 20 points. You just wonder. First one to 20, maybe wins this football game. Mm -hmm. Any other matchups that intrigue you guys through even Northwest Ohio or even in the state of Ohio? Lots of games all around. You know, I'm, I'm interested to see what Anna does against Cincinnati Country Day. I, I, I like that matchup. Yeah, yeah I, I do because I had Anna early in the year, um, a very quick team, very well coached, but everybody always says, you know, Cincinnati, that's a different animal when it comes to football, all speed everywhere. So I'd like to see, you know, where Anna matches up with their speed, Zach Osborne, if he's going to be able to get to the the perimeter uh, against Cincinnati Country Day. Yeah, for me, it's St. Mary's in London. You know, that St. Mary's team just coming off of a victory over the number one seed in that region, knocking off a very, very good Tip City team. St. Mary's has been playing better it's since about week four. They went on that two-game win streak. They think things got righted. The offense really started to light the scoreboard up the last couple of weeks of the regular season. They've carried momentum, but they've had to have – big miraculous plays right to, to win in these playoffs which is what you need right you have to have some luck um, 
But we know St. Mary's is really good. They can run the football. They can dictate the pace of play. They now go and play a London team who, you know, they may match up pretty well against. But the St. Mary's get caught looking ahead because they win. They got that. They got a potential rematch looming with Walpock. Mm-hmm, yeah. And it's, you know, are you looking too forward to the next game <laughs> and not focusing enough on the game right great in front point, of you? Great point. Yeah. Uh, guys, for me, it's Minster Cincinnati College Prep. And I'll tell you why. I don't think this Minster team is done. I think they're going to play a factor. Rogan and Steffi. I'm, t- I'm just telling you guys, it's the only team yep. that really played with Marion Local. Yep. And I say that well, it was 21 to nothing, yeah. but it was but, a close game. Yeah. I'm telling you guys. It was a close 21 nothing. Well, I'll yeah. take it. I mean, in all fairness, yeah. yeah. If you, yeah. Hold, you held Marion Local to 21 points, yeah. I mean. Yeah. Uh, I don't think they're done. I think they're going to win this week, and I think I think you could see maybe rematches down the road. I don't know. At New London, what's their mascot? I'm not sure. The fog? It should be, right? Yeah, if it's right? not the fog, oh, yeah. somebody oh, dropped on. the ball. Yeah. Somebody. Come on. Yeah. Can you imagine that decal, the fog on your helmet? That'd be yeah. sweet. They're hard to see. They, they'd be like, well, I'd be like, why is our helmet And dirty? sometimes <laughs> they get there two hours late because they're on the <laughs> fog. Oh, my gosh. This yeah. is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> It's Buckeye Chatter time. The good, the bad, and the Buckeye. We always start with you, Miles. Or we Let's always start Nate. with Nate. We never start with me. Aww. Let's start with Nate. <laughs> poor, poor Danny. <laughs> you run the show. I'm not sure why you're... It's your choice. I, say, I can do it. You literally just said, we always start with you, Miles, and, and never me. Nate, you go ahead. So you're still there picking Because I love you guys. But that's fine, because that means you won't take what I have to say, and it'll, it works out well yeah, for we're me. we're waiting for you to bash Will Howard. <laughs> We'll get there. <laughs> uh, for, for me, the the good was um, not just the defense. The defense played really well. You know, I, I I didn't know this until I started looking into to some of the recaps of the game and stuff. This is the first time that Ohio State has shut out a Big Ten opponent mm. since 2017. Whoa. A 52 nothing game uh, against Rutgers back then. Since then, that was a really bad Rutgers team. Yeah. That was yeah, really that was bad. Yeah. But but. Since then, that we haven't shut out won a lot of big get lopsided games, but no shutouts. And now this is the I believe it they it was the first they haven't given up a touchdown in like two and a half games at yeah, this point yeah, since yeah. a touchdown late in that Nebraska game. The, the defense is really rounding into form. They finally started pressuring the quarterback. They they're not kind of playing a lot of what you were um, talked about a bunch early in the season, right? Where there's just those four guys. They oh, just kind of now they, the worst. They're, they're actually putting pressure. They're forcing mistakes. They're getting three and outs. That defense looked really, really good against Purdue. Do you think Purdue should have said um, – Right, as they're getting on the bus, Coach, uh, you've been relieved of duty for trying to field goal on the three-yard line. Yeah. Right. Who kicks a field goal when you're down? You're Miles, four- who misses a field goal from the three-yard right. line? You're a 38-point dog, and you're kicking a field goal yeah. on the three. Yeah, yeah you know, why Come not? On. You never know when those points wanted, might be might Ryan come Waters into play. wanted to feel good about the team, you know? Uh, yeah. 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 Awful decision. So. Yeah. You go ahead, Miles. We'll, we'll go with you. The good? Yeah. Uh, playing a lot of guys. Right. It, it was always fun to see, you know, because you always hear these stories, especially from the, the Buckeye beat propagandists. This kid's going to be amazing. Right. And then you finally get to see some things. Um, that being said, the lovely Lexi, who was waiting for me to finish up the game after I got back from Albion College to watch it. And she's like, the score, it's over. The Buckeyes win. You already know this. Right. And I'm like, but honey, Julian Sane's going to come in. Yeah. Who? I said, he's the third string quarterback. I want to see if he's going to be our starter. You're going to wait to watch Julian Sane? I'm like, yes, yeah, yeah. yes, I am. Yes, I, I, I love watching the younger guys when they come in and see, okay, that guy is going to be a stud. So we're, we're not at the bad yet, but let's come back to the Julian Sane thing when we get okay. to the bad. Okay? <laughs> the good for me, guys, was the special teams. We blocked the punt, man. I'm telling oh, you, cool. Jack yeah. Sawyer got yeah. a scoop and score. It was yeah. awesome. We never, never have success on special teams. It seems like to me we don't get punt returns. We don't get kickoff returns i mean we've had them but in the last three or four years it's very far and few between i was super excited to see a block punt how about that great call by gus too yeah it was awesome jack sawyer <laughs> jack sawyer up. scores yeah. Buck guys rolling yeah <laughs> run, i mean i can't half expect it to hear a ron lewis <laughs> <laughs> nate for you the bad all right so i'm gonna let you guys pick which thing i can go into the bad about okay all right will howard or Julian Sane. <laughs> He's, Will Howard completed 80% he of his passes. 22 or 26 and three. It's your choice, fellas. Julian Sane. 
All right, so Will Howard's deep ball, okay? <laughs> You're off the show. <laughs> for me, for me, the the issue, and I know, we, I know, there's, I do a lot about Will Howard, but. You're, and you're right. He had a great game. He has a lot of great games. But Five times this year, over 80% yeah. completion. And, and, and that's great, but we're not <laughs> playing. He, what, my concern isn't what he's doing right now. My concern is the things that are being overlooked for when it's going to matter in the bigger games. And a lot of that, for me, has to do with his accuracy. I know you just said 80%, right. but it's when you get farther than 10 yards down the field. His deep balls are just less to be desired. He is underthrowing. And when you have a wide receiver core like we have – where guys are constantly getting behind the secondary, but he's not able to find them because he's either underthrowing them or they go out of bounds or he's not putting them where just they can catch them. I, I do I do have a long-term concern about those types of plays that could be game changers in those big games, those back-breaking plays, right? Those right. The ones that can flip momentum, but because of his inability to find those guys downfield consistently, I do get concerned about those in, in spots. A couple of things about that, right? Number one, he just doesn't rotate his back hip through. And so the ball will be short because of that. So that's a coaching thing that they can get better at. And then Chip Kelly says all the time to him, just complete passes. Just complete passes. Because it wears down a defense, right? Defensive guys got to run the guys. So that tells me that his mindset then, instead of being a deep throw guy, I'm just looking to get the ball to my guy short. And so that mindset sometimes, oh, there is a guy open late, deep, and then he tries to throw it. By then, you know, it's kind of a little bit too late. So I don't disagree with you on the deep balls. But what, here's what I say. I think the coaching staff recognizes what you recognize, and that's why we're getting the three-yard slants. That's why we're getting the over the middle. That's why we're getting the screens, because those receivers are so electric. He doesn't have to go deep. Now, there's going to come a time where they're going to come up and press them, exactly. and they're going to have to do it. But for now – A be better teams and better coaches can make those adjustments, and if he doesn't show the ability to also then make those adjustments yeah. – Connor Stallions ain't walking through that door. <laughs> so, but so that's my Will Howard yeah. for this week, okay? <laughs> for this week. For this week, yeah. But um, and on a much smaller, probably not as significant. You talked about Julian Sane. Why is he still a third string quarterback? Oh, I, uh, yeah. What 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 right. is Devin Brown doing I as the backup quarterback? Either. I don't get it. What what is what is Ryan Day doing? Why are we trying to make a senior happy? When you're you're trying Just to build for the future, we, we have him back next year. He's not coming he's back no, next yeah, year. He's no chance. Okay, not with not right. with Tavian St. Clair coming in and Julian saying emerging as your starter. And you still got Aaron Nolan in that yeah. in that room. The kid has There's not no left way. yet. I don't know if it's in his well, DNA to leave. Because they keep yeah. him the backup for some reason. So what, you, just, you, just, you just keep giving him hope that he's going to be the starter one day, and then you just keep jumping no, guys no, over? I would go back home to Utah. They're on their fourth quarterback at Utah. Their fourth I quarterback just, I just year. don't understand why Devin Brown Rising's is the backup. back next year. Yeah. I, I just don't understand why Devin Brown is, is the backup and I agree. not Julian Sane. Uh, Julian Sane should be the backup. Or whoever you're grooming. And if you're telling me that Ryan Day is grooming Devin Brown again to have the inside track to start this all for this team – it, he has shown nothing even in mop-up duty that makes me think this is going to be the starter one day that we need. So I, th I think if it's a close game, remember at Michigan State, he went in because uh, Will Howard got knocked out mm -hmm. through a touchdown pass. I think Ryan Day, in his mind, if this is a close game against a pretty good team, and I got to go with a backup to come in for Will Howard, it's Devin Brown. But if it's gonna, I'm going to start the week with a guy that's going to be my starter all week long to prep, I think that's Julian saying. The bad for you, Mo? The bad. The Jack defense. Please explain this to me. Why are we doing this? I don't understand. We, we started to play really good four-man. We're bringing pressure. We're attacking. We've got an identity defensively. We're, we're attacking again. Then all of a sudden, just because Jim Knowles likes to experiment, and this worked really good at Oklahoma State, we're going to bring it back for some reason? Why? I, I didn't understand that. Why mess with any kind of feel-good and what you're doing on defense? I, I didn't get it at all. Makes no sense. I think he just got confused he was trying to call plays for jack sawyer and then it <laughs> turned into his own position <laughs> jack uh, yeah, sawyer yeah. Scores, yeah. <laughs> for me it's the slow start i know we won the game and won the game yeah. big but every week we're we're starting slow and it really bothers me and i and i don't know if it's just lack of days ago because hey it's purdue or they're one and seven uh 
I, I don't know, but it, it has to be concerning that we see it every week. And when I say slow start, I'm talking about we always, it seems like that first drive, which is a scripted drive, That's what you I'm know, which yep. is a scripted drive and you work on it for six days in practice and we can't execute it at that level. So it's just one concern. I'm nitpicking because I think they're playing really good football right the, now. The, the concern with me, because I, I was going to say when, when you started talking about that slow start is, you know, they script the beginning yeah. and how are we starting like if we had success off of the script and then things back down but it, it, it's a coaching issue right like it like that's what it that's what it has to come down to well sometimes the other team doesn't cooperate with that script you, you think you're going to get a certain look sure. and that's why yeah, you have it on the script and sometimes they don't help you on well, it but then you have to be able to adjust i agree i, I agree. mean i agree so. i'm going to go with I'm going to start this one out. The Buckeye? No. Yeah. No, don't. I'm do going it. Don't Will do it. Howard. You know why? Oh, okay. Because oh. my man was 21 of 26 for 260 yards, three touchdowns. He is the un, unprecedented leader of this offense. I love the kid. He is a Heisman candidate right now. The whole problem with Will Howard is that in one segment, he can be somebody's player of the game and somebody else is bad. That's the whole problem with Will Howard. Well, maybe the problem is with you, Nate. Yeah, I, was just saying. Uh, <laughs> I just wanted the Grippo's yeah, NIL. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Miles, will you tell Sybil she, she can't change her mind over here? Yeah. Uh, yeah. For me, the, the, it, this feels like a cop out, but because we've done it so many times. But it was Jeremiah Smith. He set freshman he's records. He set freshman yeah. records in touchdowns and receptions. He had another great game. What he's doing on the season is, is fantastic, and he continues to be so dynamic as a true freshman that he is literally literally causing defenses to to have to change what they do against us. And you just don't see that out of freshman receivers ever. But to be able to move past Chris Carter uh, on the Ohio State list of anything is always a big deal. Oh, without a doubt, right? Especially when it comes to talking to agents. Um, <laughs> Stop Tra- Trayvon Henderson is my the Buckeye. Oh, we had a great game. Uh, he did, right? And didn't get over 100 yards, but still was a dominant force. His blocking is just so much fun to watch because if you remember when it was a freshman, they had to take him off the field on third downs because he was not a very good blocker at all. So he is a block of granite now as a blocker. I'm really excited to see if they build on this two-back set with him and Quinshawn Juckins that uh, Chip Kelly broke out. Boy, with those two guys, because Quinshawn's not shy about blocking either, Mm -hmm. you have two running backs that are going to go thump and and, and are not bashful about, I'll block for you. You know, some running backs are like, yeah, I will go two-back set as long as I'm carrying the football. These two guys are very unselfish. I'm excited to see where Travion Henderson and Quinshawn Junkins, where that grows with Chip Kelly, because you know he's got some stuff up his sleeve. Well, and I think the other bigger part about that, too, is, you know, it wasn't, it was just a few weeks ago, there was a lot of conversations about what's wrong with Travion Henderson. Yes, yes. You know, what, what's going on there? This was supposed to be this one-two punch. Injury riddled career, basically. Yeah, and now over the last couple of weeks, he's really came alive. And if this backfield now really is a true one-one-a situation, it, it brings a whole new level for Ohio State. One player we can't afford to lose on that Ohio State team. I'll go first. <laughs> okay, Nate, I'm just kidding. Devin Brown. Nice. <laughs> He had wow. me for a second. <laughs> I'm thinking, you, you believe that? <laughs> for just a second, I thought the same thing. Wow. I'm like, what? Yeah, because when we need Will Howard to go out, we have to be able to bring yeah. Devin Brown in, yeah. right? So, um, you know, I don't. It, it's getting harder and harder to pick that, and that's a good thing because there means that depth. there's a l- yeah. lot of depth there. Um, I do think at this point, though, y- and it, it sounds I, – I don't want to pick just one player necessarily, but that offensive line cannot sustain any more injuries. You know, they, they – we saw what happened, you know, earlier a couple of weeks ago. They seem to have fixed those issues with this patchwork O-line. They're doing a nice job. But clearly the depth isn't there that would be expected out of a program like Ohio State. So I just – I don't I, – right now, to me, I think it's anybody else on that starting offensive line right now. Danny uh, texted me in the middle of the game yesterday, or last Saturday, Carson Hinsman went down. And he's like, oh, no, Hinsman's grabbing his knee. Oh, was, no. Yeah, was, oh, no. Was he was devastated. Yeah. Because it, uh, what that kid has done in the last two weeks to solidify the Fantastic. offensive line. Yeah. yeah it, it, did you see what he did last week, too? He went with an old-school face mask, too. Yeah. <laughs> That's so yeah. cool, man. He's quickly becoming my favorite Buckeye because he's a nasty dude. But – I will throw this one at you, Caleb Downs, because yeah. any time that we have had an assignment that we need to take a tight end, a receiver, somebody out of the ball game, he has been able to do that. And plus, 
Do you remember a safety at Ohio State covering this much ground My and gosh, making tackles? Yeah. I mean, he's yeah. fa- fantastic. Yeah. Great call by you, right? The same number yeah. two, right? Yeah. Caleb Downs, I think, is the best safety in America. And you think he's important now? Wait till we play Michigan when they have Colston Loveland on the field and somebody has to guard him. He is a dynamic tight end. Mm-hmm. Caleb Downs is just that guy. Do they have someone to throw it to him? No, okay. not a right. chance. <laughs> uh, for me, guys, um, guy we can't lose. and I, We've talked it to death, but – you lose Will Howard, and oh, oh, there you go. I'm just telling you, Devin Brown, Devin Brown, it, yeah. Julian saying Devin Brown is not ready. He has not shown oh, us anything. Is, no, Julian saying is absolutely no. not ready because no. uh, he's not getting reps. Right. Like the, <laughs> at the, the, end of the, games. the best backup quarterback we have is in Bell Fountain, Ohio, right now. In my opinion, <laughs> he's got he's got a stronger arm than those two. He's a bigger kid, uh, guys. We're razor thin at quarterback. And I know Julian Sane is a five star and he's going to be good, but you and I saw him, Miles. He's teeny tiny. He's small. Yeah. He's no, he's really like they got him listed at six foot. Not a chance. Yeah, no, not a chance. I mean, my, my year long tirade against Will Howard aside, I do agree with yeah. you. If he goes down, I mean, you, I, everybody will appreciate Will Howard so much more at that point because there is nobody else that's ready to come in and lead this team because he has been an upgrade over Kyle McCord. He, he really oh, has been. Without a doubt. you yeah. The three of us, one of us could go out there and we, we've been an upgrade over Kyle McCord. <laughs> without a doubt. Hey, a couple of things about that, right? Will Howard... To me, though, he is that warrior guy. He could have a broken bone, like they say, his you know his tibia is cracked, and he's taping it up, and he's shooting up, Mm -hmm. and he's going to play. I just think he's that guy. It'd have to be a catastrophic injury for him not to play going forward. And then um, you brought up Tavion Sinclair, right? Tavion, we want you on the podcast. Come on, buddy. (laughs) Come on, join us. We want to talk to you, bud. Yeah, no kidding. Get back with us, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, guys, let's transition a little bit, go right into Buckeye basketball. What a great start for the men's basketball program, 2-0. and uh, We're seeing a mix of youth and experience. We've got a lot of transfers that came in. I like Jake Diebler's style. Guys, I, I, again, I'm going to have a man crush on Junie Mobley because I think he's fantastic. I don't know how long you keep no, him on the bench. He missed a three the other I know. Night. Starts his uh, college career going seven for seven behind the arc. He can't hit a two-pointer, but uh, – and Miles talked about it a little bit – He's, uh, he's going to have to really defend, uh, but I like this team. Oh, by the way, Chris Holtman fans, DePaul's 3-0. and Temper your enthusiasm. January and February here soon. And, uh, <laughs> you know what happens. That's a great start for DePaul, though. It is, yeah. And, and, and I don't hate Chris no, Holtman. No. I, I just didn't want him to be our basketball coach. No, yeah, no. You know, I, I hope he has success other yeah. places. Yeah, I mean, I think – the thing with Chris Holtman was, you know, we, he would always win a game early that was a bigger game or it'd be competitive. Duke, yeah. And they'd be like, oh, okay. And then, you know, the, the calendar would turn and it would be like, wait, why can't we win basketball games anymore? So, yes, they're off to a great start. The win against Texas is really big. Not a lot of people saw it. Not a lot of people even realized basketball was starting at I that know, point. Right? And they're playing a 10 o'clock tip off game out in Las Vegas. So, even though that was a fantastic win against a Texas team that were on a lot of people's preseason Final Four, Final Four picks, not a lot of people are ready for this Ohio State basketball team yet, right? That's one of the downsides of sure, being a sure. football co- team. I got to be honest with you, I haven't watched a minute yet. I wasn't staying up till uh, you know till 10, 11, 12 o'clock to watch that game. I also didn't think that they'd win that game. I, we talked about it the day of the game. I, did, I thought they'd be competitive. I thought that it would be close, but I didn't think that they'd be able to hang w- with that Texas team that brought a lot of transfers in as well and have a yeah. fantastic freshman. That's life in college basketball, right. isn't it? And, you know, they, they exceeded expectations. That's fantastic. You know, Youngstown State, you know, okay, it's their Youngstown State. Yeah. So <laughs> it, it, it's a, it, it is a good start. Uh, I'm excited that we're getting off to uh, off to on a positive note for Ohio State. I think Jake Diebler needed that big win against Texas to show, hey, listen, what happened at the end of last year was not a fluke. You know, we've been ready. We've been prepared. We brought the right guys in. I, I think for all Buckeye fans, though, Everybody was going to be waiting to see what happens in January. Yeah, don't be surprised, fellas, if they don't if they get beat Friday night. They're at Texas A and M. It's a top yeah. twenty five Aggie team. It's a very well coached team. Here's the thing: the Texas game was in a neutral site. It was in Vegas. They played in front of like thirty five people. The horrible crowd. Yeah. Horrible crowd. This is on Texas A and M campus. This is a big game for them. Their students will be there. So let's if they lose that game, I'm not going to worry yeah. about it. Well, at all. and I, I think it. 
I think that their ranking is a little inflated. It sure. was a great game against a Texas team that people, a lot of people have a lot of respect for. But to jump up to twenty one yeah, after cool, we, though. you know, it's great to see him back in the pool in on the polls and relevant. But I also do think that that may give some casual Buckeye fans a little false sense of where maybe this team's at. Yeah. And then if they go to Texas A and M and they lose, people are like, oh, same old Buckeyes. Well, that's not. I really don't think that's the case. Danny, at Texas A and M, do they they have their yell leaders for basketball? Yes, yes they wear the white. Outfits and their big megaphones. So and weird. The, yeah, <laughs> home with the twelfth man. So home with the twelfth man. I hope we go down there and get a win. Um, here, here's what I like about this Buckeye basketball team. We don't have that island of misfit toys look anymore. No. Where like, why is that kid at Ohio State? Oh, well, he was really good in Brooklyn at six five playing the post. Yeah. What? No, yeah. no. These are all guys. You go back to the Jim O'Brien regime, <laughs> right? I know you're talking about. I was actually going Zed Key on that one, right? He's <laughs> a date and he's having a nice career. Yeah, good for him. Yeah. But, I mean, he was not a Big Ten post guy, right? He, he was a great six guy that maybe come off the bench. But all these dudes, they look like dudes. Yeah. These, these are all guys who's like, that kid should be playing at Ohio State. Yes, I agree, right? The length, the athleticism. And, Danny, how about this? We don't painfully dribble the ball no. up the floor and try to work the clock to get a good shot with the sets that everybody knows we're running, right? We are high tempo. We're going to try and score in the 80s. It is so much fun. College basketball now, make threes, defend threes. Jake Diebler gets it, right? Mm -hmm. This is modern basketball. This is what's fun about it. I look at Micah Parrish and, and Bruce Thornton, and I look Love at two Micah guys. Parrish. Yeah, I look at two guys that own that locker room. They're going to set the standard. Micah Parrish, and I think you said it best, we lost Roddy Gale last Shh. year to Michigan. Oh, I think we upgraded make that with trade Micah Parrish. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Guys, our three local guys, Colin White, Austin Parks, Kalen Etzler, I'm just going to say this. Of the three, Austin Parks is going to get the most minutes because of his size. He's going to be asked to come in and defend in the Big Ten. He's a big guy. He's 6'10", uh, tree trunk legs. Kalen Etzler, he's happy to be in the program. I, and I'm not, that's not a shot at Kalen mm -hmm. Etzler. He's not going to play a lot. And Colin White, look, he's a freshman. He's got a lot of things to work on. I don't think you're going to see a lot of minutes out of Colin White this year. And I think beneficially for him down the line, that's a good thing. I really think that's a good thing. Colin White is going to be a factor in the next four years in this program. And Colin White's the kind of kid that's going to stay. He's a Buckeye. He's yeah. not leaving. Yeah. And I, I think you're right. I, I think that you know we, we when we talked to to the Buckeye insider you know um, for the basketball yeah. uh, last week we asked him Andy specifically Baxter. yeah, Andy yeah. Baxter, yeah. Well, we we talked specifically about those three guys and asked him hey what are you guys hearing out of this program and he kind of said the same thing the thing about Kalen Etzler was he he's he's a great locker room guy for them mm -hmm. he's been in that program now for multiple years you need guys that are like that not everybody is going to be start there not everybody's going to be in the rotation not everybody's going to be able to be the superstar but if you want to be a successful team you have to have guys that buy into what you're doing and that will help you in practice and will help you be successful and will cheer the successes and will do all those things and it sounds like that's the type of player that they have in Kalen Metzler and he he comes to work every day he puts in his time he he's not um a distraction he you know he's not doing other things he comes in he he does his work he gets to play basketball he doesn't get a lot of minutes but I think he's doing all those little things that successful programs need and that's a good thing for him I, I do think Austin Parks will get quite a bit with the, we talked they he, they talked about they really like his size mm -hmm. and what he can do in his strength and Austin Parks has always had that look right he we've had guys come out of this area like D1 maybe you know right 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 the moment you see Austin Parks like that's a division one basketball player yeah. he is a big guy he had to work on some things he's but he has he, ha he has yeah. put the work in and he's getting better he can bang underneath in the big 10 he can be that difference man that where i disagree with you a little bit is colin white I, I think they'll bring colin white around slowly but i think colin white is a jake diebler guy jake diebler was heavy into Colin yeah. White's recruitment. He is the oh, reason Colin. that yeah. Colin White went there. When that change got made last year, you we talked to Colin mm -hmm. White on the radio, sure and he did. said, Jake Dealer's my guy. He did my recruiting. I, I'm with him. And so – I think that Jake Diebler has a lot of faith in Colin, and I think if Colin continues to progress, I do think that we will probably see Colin on the floor and get some decent minutes. I don't think he gets a yeah. lot because 
he's a freshman and we'll see how the rotation works. But I do think that we will see Colin White on the floor more than I think a lot of people thought we would uh, this time last year. Yeah, Etzler's still kind of working his way back from an injury, so time will tell mm -hmm. if he's going to be able to get some minutes or not. If he does, it'll be the first time in his Buckeye career that he gets serious minutes, right? Uh, Parks, big difference. When you watch him this year, Danny and Nate, he's got a look. He does. Right? He's got an intense look. He'd come in last year, he'd be kind of wide-eyed. Not this year. He wants minutes, so that's important, right? Mm -hmm. uh, he's going to have to be a rebounder when Bradshaw has to come off the floor. If he can do that, he's going to continue to get minutes. Colin White, here's what I'd like to bot him against Youngstown State. New to the program still. Three assists in limited time. So that tells me he understands good. the offense, right? Mm -hmm. Diebler even said that in the post game. Hey, Colin White, three assists in his time that he got out there. But – Will he be able to defend? That will be the determination on if he's going to play extended minutes for Diebler, if he's going to be able to defend. If he can't defend, especially when you get to the Big Ten, you just can't play. Well, part of the problem with, with a freshman at that level is this. When they bring you out on the perimeter, are you quick enough to go side to side? I don't know that he's at that level yet. He'll get there. And the other thing is, they're going to back him down in the post. Are you strong enough to defend? Yeah, absolutely. Those are the two things that he's going to have to work on. If he can't do those things, he's, he's not going to get on the floor. That's just the way it is. And you brought up a great point about Diebler recruiting Colin White. We forget what a great recruiter Jake Diebler. Do you know when he was at Vanderbilt, he was the chief recruiter for Darius Garland? Darius Garland's a pretty good player yeah, in the yeah. NBA. That was his guy. Jake Diebler is going to bring in players that Chris Holtman couldn't get. Yeah. You're seeing it already. And the thing about uh, the follow-up on Colin White as well, his ball handling. Everybody said, well, is he going to be able to handle the ball? Oh, at, I think at, he at, will. Yeah, so he got those three assists by being on the perimeter. So 6'6", six, six, handling the basketball on the perimeter, those are things that just aren't natural, right? Right. All right, guys, you can pick one team. You can't pick Marion Local to win <laughs> the state title. I know it's not my rules. He did it. It's the last segment of the night. Give me one. Well, we've gone from three to two to I now know, one, right? And we have taken Marion <laughs> Local out of it. This well, is kind of unfair. And, and, and the most teams that we have left in a division is seven. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm going to go with Coldwater. I, I, I just have always liked Chip Botten, and I want him to get a, a, a state title. It's a veteran team. I, I just think. And uh, they don't have to play Marion Local. That's right. <laughs> yeah, right. Very true. It's, it's, a, it's very nice not to be in the same division, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, for me, <laughs> it, it, it's tough because there's a lot of really good teams in D7 I like. I really like that Columbus Grove team. Um, I, I think that, you know, I, my concerns about them not being challenged until they get to Marion Local do worry me a little bit. But I do think that a team like Columbus Grove with the style that they play, if you're going to challenge Marion Local – that's the style that you got to be able to play. You got to control the clock. You got to control the tempo. You you know you got to keep the ball out of their hands. You got to be able to go you know the length of the field. So um, if Marion Local doesn't win it and we can't pick them, I'm going to go with Grove. Yeah, I'm going to agree with Miles. I'm going to go with Coldwater and just simply because they don't have to play Marion Local. Yeah. I, yeah. Look, they're we go on a ledge, guys. Well, Let's go to saying, a different division. Where you go? Yeah, they're a <laughs> Mac tested squad. They yeah. they don't flinch. They're so well coached. Look, you got to go up against the Giant every year, and unfortunately, they haven't been able to slay the Dragon. But when they get to the playoffs, they don't have any issues. They don't have any issues. So yeah, you got to go up against the Giant, and mm -hmm. unfortunately, they haven't been able to slay the Dragon. Yeah, I'm using all the <laughs> Yeah, I got them all. Hey, that, that might be why they've had a trouble. They're like, they get to the Giant, like, where's the, the Dragon? dragon. <laughs> Coach, you, guys, you said there's a Dragon. You here. guys are dragging me down, and that is the three wise men, guys. Thanks a lot. Let's do it again next week. Okay, see you there. <laughs>